Good morning, let's begin. Page 361, I'll fly away. Page 361, let's all stand, shall we? Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to the home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, God, the second when the shadows of this life have gone I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars have flown I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah you'll recall, pastor is gone. I don't know where he is. He could be any one of five states. But uh, pray for him. Pray for him. And I was getting nervous. Our speaker, Brother Mike, didn't get in till just before. Uh, I don't have anything ready. Welcome, Mike. Glad, glad to see you for a lot of reasons. <laughs> but let's, let's begin in prayer, please. Lord, we're grateful for this opportunity to come to be in your house, to hear from your word. Thank you for Brother Mike and the memories we have of him while he was here. We ask your blessing upon the service. Give him power to touch hearts that the people that are, that are here and are coming will be blessed and changed and they might, <clears throat> they might well, be able to glorify you in their, in their lives. Bless this time now. Bless your word because we know you will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It's time to recognize the birthdays and anniversaries for this week. Birthdays, I only see one listed pastor, and would you believe he's not here? So we're really going to have to welcome him back with a happy birthday when he gets back. Anyone else have a birthday this week where you don't know about anybody? Your birthdays this week? Okay, anniversaries. I don't see any anniversaries for this week. Anyone have an anniversary this week we don't know about? Anyone? Okay, the next song. Page 376, one day, page 376.
of the month is over to page 39 great is the lord page 39 Mike, we're ready for you. And it's been a long time since I saw you guys. How many years have you been here? Uh, well, we dropped by uh, three or four years ago, maybe, on a midweek, just kind of a drop through. Huh. Um, and at that time, everybody was over there. And uh, so it's been, I don't know how long it's been, since 14. Wow. Yeah. And well, good 13. to see you. Good seeing you, brother. It's been a long time. Yes, sir. You got the beard now. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Trying to draw attention from where there's not hair anymore, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's working. Oh my, it is a it is a blessing to be back, and uh, oh my, it's kind of it was kind of uh, powerful, you know, when you haven't been to a place in a while, to but yet you have a great sense of uh, appreciation to kind of be back on the property and walk around. We, Heather and I and the boys were over there in the, the old parsonage there when we were here. And uh, of course the boys were a lot smaller and younger both <laughs> back then. And uh, so uh, last night we were kind of walking around the backyard there down by the lake and everything. And I don't know, it just kind of uh, tugs at your heart a little bit. And uh, But for a good reason, you know, because um, we came here after we had returned from Africa. Things had not gone as we had saw them, saw it happening, and in our service over, in our time over there, and all that, and um, kind of come back, just trying to kind of figure out what was next in life, praying about a lot of things, but not sure. And you were this church was one of our supporters, and I called Pastor Ruley and, and let him know that we were know that we were back, and uh, he had such love and grace for us. Um, in a time when we really needed it. I mean, we really needed it. And uh, he took us in and uh, said, you don't have to do anything. You just come over here. But if you want to do something, you're welcome to do something. And so while we were here, we worked with the youth. And I tried to sit and soak up as much information off of him uh, whenever I could get a chance. I had never pastored before. been a youth pastor for a lot of years up to that time. And so everything, he was, he was, a, he was just a great mentor. Uh, to me. And uh, even though we left, uh, in our hearts, we took, we took a lot with us. And so coming back is, a, is an emotional, a powerful thing. And um, Heather and I just have nothing but gratitude. She sent some pictures to the boys of the backyard and the house and everything. And they were just kind of going back and forth, you know, sharing, you know, that it, how much they loved their time here. Wish it had been longer, probably should have been longer <laughs> in some ways. But the Lord knows all. God does all things well. Um, but it's just great to be back here. Uh, when I bumped into Pastor and uh, Sister Amy over to Amy, right? Yeah, Amy, really, right? Uh, I don't know. My brain is not right anymore either. I don't know. Anybody else have that COVID thing happen? That's what we blame it on anyways. It may or, not, may or may not be, but it's a great excuse. 
Uh, that's what I'm doing now. But anyway, we bumped into them over at the church worker seminar a few weeks back and, and just kind of caught up a little bit. And, um, and uh, you know, he never gets older. Have you noticed? He looks the same. He looks the same. I'm like, what, is, what in the world? It's not fair, you know. But anyway, so we, we visited for a while, and, uh, I, and I said, hey, you know, Amy was kind of talking. I was like, when have you guys, she's talking about how tired. And I said, when was the last time you had a vacation? She's like, I don't know. And I, and I said, that's not right. And I know how trusting he is with the pulpit, you know. I know. <laughs> that's one thing I really remember. Pastor really just, he just opens a pulpit to anybody all the time. Very sarcastic here. Uh, no. Anyway, so I said, hey, if you trust me enough, I'd love to come and, and be in your pulpit for, so you can have a little time away. And so here we are. The Lord worked it out. And so the, many of you don't know us. Uh, you're not familiar with our ministry. Uh, when we left here, we wound up in New Paris, and I wound up pastoring there. That was the church we originally sent out of to Africa. We, we were there for several years. The Lord, by his grace, certainly not by my experience <laughs> or ability, God really blessed the work there, amazingly. Um, but while we were on deputation to go to Africa, I know I'm jumping around here a little bit, but just stay with me. Uh, we, had, uh, we had been in so many churches that were really in bad shape, and many of them had pastors that were very senior in their years with absolutely nothing in the cupboard to uh, replace, and uh, we became burdened about it because, you know, the church is supposed to be a mission organization, and, um, and uh, when, if the church not only raises up missionaries, but it also sends them and helps them stay there, and as we lose churches in America, we lose the missionaries to send, and we lose the ability to send missionaries all at the same time, and missionaries that are on the support, lose their, on the field, lose their support, some of them having to come home or spend their furloughs on on deputation again, uh, and so the Lord burdened us about this, didn't give us any opportunity to do anything about it at the time other than just to encourage churches to, you know, be diligent in their labor, <clears throat> and, um, but then again, in the spring of 18, uh, pastoring there in New Paris, uh, the Lord gave us liberty to resign that church, to have the assistant was voted in uh, unanimously, which I wasn't, so that kind of stunk, you know, and <laughs> anyway, it was voted in, and we, and we, Stepped out by faith to start Open Door Ministries. Uh, it was a fulfillment of the, of the burden that we saw while we were raising our support a number of years before. And we traveled uh, for five years full-time, going church to church, working with those who were without pastors. And so, really, our ministry is quite simple. Uh, we, we connect churches and pastors together. That's what we do. Um, we don't, it's not that we're super smart or anything like that, because we're not, but we facilitate. Uh, many times churches, uh, when they lose a pastor, if, especially if he's been there for a long time, they don't have experience in transitioning from one pastor to the next. And so how do we go about that? Where do we find suitable candidates? What does a suitable can candidate believe? What does he, you know, so we just kind of, we take their, uh, who they are, and then who the resumes that come in as a result of our posting ads for them, we come in and we'll help them review them, give counsel to them through the process, and help them to uh, have what we believe are quality options. We don't pick a pastor. We never have picked a pastor for anybody. That's a local church matter. But we try to, we try to be sure that the options they have to choose from are biblically qualified men. Um, because there's those who are out there that are looking to pastor that see it as a career path, uh, not as a calling. We see that we've encountered all sorts of interesting things. I can tell you stories all day uh, about some of the interesting things we have encountered. Uh, but... So there's a great necessity for the ministry. Um, and uh, I say this often, that we lose our churches uh, a couple of different ways. One, we lose them when they can't get a pastor, they dwindle and close. Two, we lose them when they stay open, but they get a pastor that is not a man of God, and he takes him down a road that is not biblical, and they end up out in left field doctrinally, and basically they lose God's blessing uh, as, a, as a body of Christ. And so our concern is both of those things, to keep the doors open, one, yes, but to make sure that as they stay open, they stay active and are in a place where God can continue to bless them. And so uh, <laughs> when uh, I still remember uh, one of the ladies in our church, when I, last, one of the, well, when I announced to the church that I was resigning to, for this ministry, and she said to me, she goes, well, Pastor, where are you going to, where are you, what church are you going to go help first? And I said, or where is it at? I said, I don't know. And she looked at me, she was, you're, 
she was, she, like, I was crazy. And I said, listen, I know this is what God has for us to do. I believe with all my heart that God is going to bring these pieces and parts together. And so it, it took about a year of the ministry for folks to find out about our name. In the Midwest, some of you are like, well, it's, it's not working. I don't know about you. But, uh, but through social media, through connections with pastors and people that are sitting in churches right now that know about churches that need pastors, it is amazing how the churches, how they find out about us and how they come to us. So what started out as a step of faith that God honored uh, turn, has turned into now to where we're dealing with over 55 churches that are, you know, independent Baptist or Bible, or Bible churches that are without pastors. And as I tell everybody, we're, the, we're representing the tip of the iceberg in America. There are so many, so many churches right now that are without pastors. It's mind-blowing. Uh, we don't know about all of them. And because we're independent, <laughs> we don't know about them. There's, you know, we're not a part of a convention, so there's no data to be tracked. It's only what people know about. And, and of course, God knows that's the most important thing. And so uh, we, we do this ministry by faith. Uh, just yesterday afternoon, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. I answered it. It's another church in Ohio. It's, it's just all the time. And so since 2018, uh, the Lord has allowed us to be a part of 104 pastors being placed. Um, and it start, like I said, it started out slow. It's built every year. I think this year we're around 30 pastors, getting close to 30 pastors that have been placed just this year alone. And so it's, we, we, in 2020 was almost a dead year entirely. Almost nobody was going anywhere, taking a church. I think we saw only six pastors called in 2020, which even that somewhat surprised me that that even happened. Uh, but those were all, I think, late in the year. Um, but so God has been abundantly good to us. Um, we never, <laughs> I told Heather uh, when we started this ministry or somewhere, somewhere early on in it, I said, uh, well, we'll know that God's done with us in this ministry when either the finances dry up or when we run out of churches to help. Now, then there's also God doing what God does, right? So there's a third way too. But uh, anyway, we have not come anywhere close to running out of churches. <laughs> and so uh, we really covet your prayers. Um, I know that uh, some of you pray for us already. I know Pastor really pr- prays for us. Every now and then he'll send me a text and he'll say, I pray for you every day. And that just humbles me and blows my mind because of all the people he knows and, the, and I know he prays for his church family. I know that for sure. Uh, that, he, that he prays for us. That, that, that's such a blessing to us. And so we have some prayer cards. We didn't set our display up. Our display is not that impressive. I was always, when we were going to Africa, we had this massive table. And I had a boa hide that was like 14 feet long that, that had been tanned that laid out over the top. And every missions conference, every kid wanted to be at our table. And all the other missionaries were like, man, this isn't fair. Well, now we're those missionaries. <laughs> uh, everybody knows what a, what a church with a for sale sign in the yard looks like. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's not a pleasant thing, but it's not exciting. But it is something that's a real serious thing that God's people ought to be concerned about. And so I encourage you, we'll, we'll set some prayer cards back there that you grab one, that you take it. Um, we have something that we started a couple years ago, and if you'll grab one of our prayer cards and take a picture of the QR code, it'll direct you right to the website. And we have a placement tab there that has all the churches we are currently working with. And um, uh, at the top of that page, uh, top of that tab area, there's a contact card that you can fill out. And, hey, listen, uh, I believe in the power of prayer. I I mean, I'm not just saying that because that's the Christian thing to say. I believe in the power of prayer. I've felt it. I've seen it. Uh, We're commanded, Jesus commanded his disciples in in uh, Matthew 9, 38, says, pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest field. We're commanded to pray this way. And so I, I invite you. Uh, I could say I beg you, because I believe in the power of, it, of prayer, to get on there and to look down through those lists of churches. Maybe God would speak to your heart about one or two churches, to just not the whole list. I love specific prayer. I think that's what gets God's attention. Pick a, ch- a church or two if God would put this on your heart. And fill out the information in that little thing. Send it to us. It'll, it's an email thing. And when that church calls a pastor, you'll get an email back letting you know that God, you had a part in praying for a church that got a prayer that was answered. God answered prayer, sent a pastor to that church. 
Uh, today, for instance, we have a church in uh, uh, Iowa, Dubuque, Iowa, that has a candidate there. Uh, and it looks very positive. I'm praying that within the next week they have a pastor at that church, and they've been looking for several years. Uh, we, have church, we have a church in North Dakota, the middle of nowhere. And uh, it's a great little church. We were just there. I baptized five people there when we first started our trip heading east from Montana. Um, great little church. But I know this is going to shock you. Not everybody wants to live in North Dakota. I mean, it's a balmy, warm climate. No, it's not. Uh, but it is a beautiful area, and there's people that love it and live there, and, and, uh, and the little town is just a quaint little place, and, uh, but a healthy church, healthy body of Christ there. And uh, I'm praying God would give that church a pastor. They've been looking for quite a while. And so we have some of these that are in places that are, um, you know, like them. They're 80 miles from Bismarck. That's the nearest Walmart. Uh, how many ladies enjoy shopping at Walmart or other shopping on them? without driving an hour and a half. <laughs> and so you see some of the challenges, right? But I just happen to believe that God wants to give these churches pastors because they're biblical churches. And I just ask you that maybe you would, like I said, please grab a prayer card and uh, maybe you would partner with us in prayer uh, if the Lord would lead you to do that. That'd be such a blessing. Um, and I asked pastor about this before I took liberty to present our ministry. He told me to. Uh, is there any questions? I mean, I, I, have, I can teach but I can also answer questions about our ministry. Uh, is there anybody have any questions or comments regarding it that in this time we could? Well, you say that right now you've got 50 ministries that are, that are, that you're helping. Right. In the process. How, you know, I'm an ops guy and I'm an engineer, so I, I, how in the world do you manage 50 different, you know, assemblies of God, right? Yeah. Little, little yeah. Of Christ. How do you manage 50 at the same time? It's, it's, Sometimes it's overwhelming to be, and, I, and I'm not taking too much on ourselves here, okay? Um, I don't want to take too much credit for what God does, because those of you who know me <laughs> know that it's God uh, and my wife. Uh, well, let me just let me just pause it. I'll remind me what your question was in five minutes, because I'll have forgotten by the time I answer this. But uh, so when we <laughs> majority of the of the pastors are found through Facebook and websites, social media, interacting that way. And I can't do, I mean, I know how to get on there, but if I send an email, I'm going to mess it up. I promise you. I can't, atta I, I mean, I, if you want to mess it up, ask me to, to send an email with attachments. Everybody will get it that's not supposed to and on and on. So the website, all that's, that's, we're a team. And what Heather does is, I can't estimate to you her part of the ministry and how huge it is. If it wasn't for her, I'd be working with one church in person. That's all I would know how to do. Uh, maybe, maybe I could take, manage two or three. But um, because we have a database um, that we have all these churches entered in, so like yesterday, I'll make a phone. This guy calls me, uh, and so immediately I pop our database up. We enter information about the church, try to figure out where they're at. I ask questions that kind of help me determine the health of the church. Sometimes it's not what they say, or it's not what they say, but what they don't say. Uh, that can, you can figure things out. And so um, we we'll go through that interview process, and then we, we check through on a weekly basis. Sometimes it gets two weeks, but we go through there, and we, we check. We just have a schedule of calling through and checking back with these churches. And so some churches are, have experienced pulpit committees. They know the process. They have their own process. With them, our workload is not so much. Uh, uh, they, we encourage them, hey, if you have, when we post the ad for you, and people start sending resumes. If you want to tell us who's sending the resume, we know we know who's out there. But for the most part, we know who's out there because we get a lot of responses. And so I can give them a, a quick synopsis of this guy, whether I think he'd be a good fit or not. But it's their decision. We have guys who send their resumes who I can't vouch for as a candidate um, because I know stuff about them. I cannot do that. And so without saying too much, I, I caution and say, listen, you need to ask some questions about this or look at their social media, check this, you know, check this stuff out. Um, and so that's sort of how we do it. And so that takes some of the workload off of the you know, 55, however many churches it is. Others are much more intense where we just spend a lot of time on the phone counseling and as we can get to the others, we get to them you know, type of thing. Uh, right now, you know, we're, we're probably in the first part of the week, we're gonna have to hit it pretty hard with our call throughs again because this, we've been traveling now for a month and a half, 
And when you're continually pulling up and moving all the time, it's hard to maintain every aspect of it. And so it, we have to, you know, we just have to make it work. But it is very time consuming. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many times I've prayed in this ministry, Lord, um, I have to just cast this burden on you because I can't fix it. You see things, you know it's trouble, but I can't fix it. They're your people. And so we have to unload that burden on the Lord. And so I feel like we are able to give them each specialized care. Nobody, I don't, again, not bragging, stating the fact. We saw, that our, we saw something that was missing. We saw a lot of churches that were listed we knew about. But when you check in, they don't know what they're doing. And nobody's helping them. Nobody's counseling them through the process. And so that's what we do. And I say it's a counseling-heavy ministry. It is. It's just phone call, phone call, emails, text, you know, all the normal things. So that's a good, good question. I hope I answered it well. We're, we're nationwide. Um, we have one church just over the border into Canada. Um, that's another... That's super difficult. That you might as well be looking, place an ad for a missionary to some foreign, you know. I mean, obviously, I mean, like around halfway around the world, because they have even a greater shortage of workers than we do, up there. And you have to have, you're, you might again, you go in there and setting up residence there is as difficult as it is as going to a lot of other countries around the world. And so, um, but we cover the United States. Um, our biggest for sure, we help more churches than you just say in the Midwest than anywhere else. I think that's just natural when you have contacts there. That's where the roots have branched out. Part of our relocating to Montana this uh, year was due to the fact that the Northwest and the Northeast, there's parts of our country that are very unreached uh, with good churches, very thin, and also help because there's not that many churches, they have very few resources to help them when they get in trouble. And so we're trying to develop a, a base of familiarity out there with churches so that when they have needs, they know that they can reach out to us too. So. Can you help us understand why there is a pastor shortage? Um, <laughs> I think there's a, there's, so, there's a lot of reasons why. I don't think I know all of them. Uh, some of them I don't understand for sure. But I remember, uh, you know, 25 years ago, anyways, hearing that we're going to have a shortage, there's a shortage of pastors coming in our country, and the people were basing that off of enrollment at Bible college and what people were majoring in, um, and then not just what they were majoring in, but what when they graduated, then what they pursued, what their calling was that they pursued. Um, and I, I heard some numbers a while back, this has been several years ago now, and so, but for instance, one class at a very recognizable Bible college, everybody here would, would recognize this young man himself said that was in that class. It started out, there's 120 some of us for pastoral ministries. A couple years into it, the class was in half. Um, by the time they graduated, there was around 30. Um, and he said at that time that of that 30, and this was a year or two post-graduation, he said that he only knew about 12 that were actually still heading in that direction. And so when you, when you crunch the numbers, <laughs> uh, that's, where, that's a lot of it. Uh, what we see more than guys getting burnout, we see men who are aging out. Their burnout's a real thing, too, very real thing. Um, and so we're losing, you know, pastors or their wives get hurt, get tore up in the ministry, and they're like, look, I didn't, you know, I don't know what to do. You know, we, we can't function. We're, we're, we're broke. We can't function. And so... They step to the side for a while, Lord willing, some of them will get back in line and keep on going, um, but it's understandable uh, that that happens. Um, so I think there's a, those are two of the biggest reasons why I think we have a shortage. Um, and I was a youth pastor for 12, 13 years, okay? And so when I was, and I was blessed to be raised in a Christian home and in a Bible-believing church. And so I don't remember ever having a youth conference or having missionaries through our church when the, while they were there, the missionary or the evangelist, the guest speaker, the teenagers, the young, the children were always had these people put in front of them as being something to consider, something to pray about. I mean, we were we were we were told stories of David Livingston and and William Carey and 
all the, all the great missionaries of years gone by, and it was presented as a heroic thing, as a, a great way to serve, a, a, an exciting way to serve the Lord. Part of the reason why we went to Africa, I'm sure, was influenced based off my childhood um, in that regard. So what I have noticed, though, is there is not, in my experience, what I'm seeing, and you might, this is, you might have different experience, but what I'm seeing is there's not hardly any of that going on like there used to be. Uh, young people are being encouraged towards uh, professional, you know, secular careers. Serving in a church, yes, that's great. He, you know, our middle son, Logan, you guys, some of you remember him. He never once felt God called him to full-time ministry. He's like, I want to be a faith, I want to be, oh, <clears throat> he wanted to be like his grandpa. His grandpa was a deacon in a church for a lot of years and um, served the Lord faithfully, was a pillar in the church. Gave sacrificially to missions and to just that's because that's what God. I feel like that's my call. And I said, "Great, praise the Lord for that." I'm excited for every child that God leads that way. Don't get me wrong. Not everybody is called to mission work or to pastoral ministry. We get that, but let's have all of our kids pray about it. I wanted all my boy, all three of our boys, to pray about it and let God's will be done. Um, and so, I understand that what's important to me will become important to my children. And so I feel like what is important to me and how I, how, how I steer the ship gives them a greater chance of doing something that way, right? Um, and so, but ultimately, we want God's call to be on their lives. Um, and I'm not, I believe God is still calling young people. I just absolutely believe that. I say this, that I believe if Jesus was coming back this afternoon, and he could, that he still might call somebody in the morning service to, to, to surrender to mission work. Because he only knows the time, and he wants to see if we're willing. You know, he's going to gauge us off our obedience, not off how successful we are by measurements that we might put out there. So, Ron? Ron? Okay, so that's a good question, too. He asked how many kids out of college do we get to place in a church. And so very few into the pastoral position. We do help. We run listings for, for school teachers, for youth pastors, for assistant pastors as well. And we've helped, I'm at 12 or so, not, but that's not our main ven, uh, avenue of ministry. Um, we've, uh, so in a pastorate position, not that many. Uh, occasionally you'll find a man who went to college later in life and he's got life experience to go with his training now. And I feel like those guys are prepared to take maybe the senior role of senior pastor uh, in certain situations, but most young guys, I mean, our son Michael will be 26 here pretty soon, and I say this all the time, he's a great guy. He's preaching this morning for a church in Georgia that doesn't have a pastor, but he's not ready to pastor, and he's graduated from Bible college, he's, he's, he's sharp, he's smart, uh, you know, and, but, you know, so at that age, that's a lot of the reasons why we just kind of, you know, I know of a young, <laughs> we helped a young guy uh, find a church. He's pastoring. He was 23 years old when he was voted in. Exception to the rule. Very much the exception to the rule. Um, and it's a very small church. It's a complete rebuild, so it's kind of like he's not taking over a lot of stress that's already, or a lot of administrative responsibility, big decisions. He doesn't have to do that, and so um, I think in those cases, you know, it can, it can work out, but not that often. Right. But the world offers a lot of other jobs with a lot more money. Right. And I think that's where the, the world right. has totally. Right. Well, and, let, and so uh, Brother uh, John makes an interesting point there, too. Here's the thing. Everybody has a, these young men have a wife to take care of, too, okay? And they have a family responsibility. And I've been bivocational almost my entire ministry career. Even now, we're not fully supported as missionaries. We, 
I, I work with my hands to try to make up the gap. We're trying to raise support right now. That's part of what we're doing on this big trip we're on. But so when a young man comes out of college, a lot of these men come out without any trade, trade experience. You know, and I think if there's an oversight in our Bible colleges, it's that we're not saying, hey, uh, let's, let's help these guys learn how to do mechanics or construction or something like that because I, this is a statistic I cannot prove, but I heard this when we were early on in this ministry that like something in a way of uh, over 80% of our independent Baptist churches are bivocationally pastored. That means he works a job. And he's pastoring a small church, general, almost always. That's why he's bivocational. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if you look, just humanly speaking, you say, hey, you can start over here for 75 right off the bat. We'll hire you with your education. Um, or you can go pastor this church for 25 to 40 a thousand a year, take on the stress of the ministry and all the things that he's been warned about in college, or if his dad was a pastor that he observed. Uh, you, you better really be anchored in your call, you know. And when you get discouraged, which you will, and you deal with all these things, it's a very natural struggle. We call it the world, yes, but it's also a, I got to feed my family. I have my first responsibility is to feed and clothe and take, provide for my wife. Um, we, have, we have pastors aging out who have no retirement. We have pastors that stay too long because they can't afford to retire. Because nobody thought they were, Jesus was going to be gone, wait this long. Hey, you don't need Social Security, now that you can live on it, but you don't need Social Security, opt out. Uh, hey, you don't need to plan for retirement, you know, so all these things. And um, so we have a lot, we have challenges as independent churches that need to be addressed by the, by the leadership of the church and say, hey, we got, if we want this church to continue past this, we got to make it possible for our pastor when he needs to, when he feels it's time, to say, okay, I've, I've done my part. Let's pass this, the torch now. And he can, if he's in a parsonage, he can move out. He, ha he has money to go get his own place, so he's not occupying the parsonage. Or if he passes, his, wife, his widow is not left in the parsonage or homeless. These are all realities we deal with all the time. Um, and so we need to, you know, I think we need to be a little more wiser in the world uh, you know, Jesus commended, in some ways, the wisdom of the world in that they, they plan, they lay up. So. I think what's louder than, than the world's pulse is that the world is always going to take an open hand. Right. I think it's the testimony of our churches, either through the Christian school movement or our churches themselves, have not been that, that shining light, right? Our testimonies have either staff members or, or, or deacons or even the pastors through the council have let, let carnal things in. Right. And so where, what's the difference? So these young people, they, we can tell them, oh, you need to be a man. <clears throat> you need to go to X, X right. Christian school for university training. But when they see your lives and they see the lives of the parents, right. they can stick their hand. They see, they, they, they see we're not one in Christ. Right. I mean, it's real. Yeah, it's no, you <laughs> you're preaching. <laughs> and we're not holding Christ as the number one thing for us yeah. to do. Yeah. Why bother? Yeah. You know? I don't know. No, I you there's so there's it's such a it's such a spider web and um honestly, uh is it really fair to say our tell our young people, you need to pray about what God would have you to do when when other people in their lives that they look up to never have. I'm saying that even now. Everybody here, we're not talking to children here. Everybody here, we ought to have the prayer in our heart, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. What will you have me to do? Because it may not be a calling or a location difference, but it may be a difference in the day of how you order your day or what, you, what your priority of the day is. And when, if, if we're doing that, we can look at our kids and honestly say, yes, I prayed about that, and this is what God has me to do. And with an honest and clear conscience, we can say that. But if we haven't, or if we won't, it's funny how kids have a way of knowing our heart. And, you know, and they're like, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I saw, I heard, but then I also saw. And I lived in the house with you. And that's not really been my experience. So authentic, being authentic, all that. I saw him back here. Uh, 
uh, well, I would, I would uh, never recommend a person who has not been mentored by a senior pastor. I don't care what your degree is. If you've not served next to a senior pastor and watched how it works, uh, then you're not, you're not ready. Truthfully, book training is no way, is so inadequate for when you're dealing with people. It's, you got just black and white. All these situations are black and white, no gray area. You deal with people, it's nothing but gray area. Everything is different. Oh, the variables are different. Well, they go back to the textbook. Nope, didn't cover that. Um, so I say, if you give me a guy that's grown up next to a pastor and he has some Bible education, I'd take him any day of the week over a guy that's got a high, high degree of education but just lacks that interpersonal relationship. Got a call yesterday with the church we're helping, and the pastor that's there has only been there five years, and this is his last Sunday today. The reason being, this man said, my assessment is he never connected with the people. He, never, he failed to connect with the people. That is huge. Doctrinal agreement, important. Personal testimony, important. But you have to connect. People, we have hearts. We have personalities. We, we bond towards each other or repel from each other, whatever. Um, but you have to have that connection. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend a, a man who, you know, I'm not saying it can't happen because God is God. I mean, John the Baptist, not the most magnetic you know, figure in the world. God seemed to use him pretty good, but generally speaking. So, all right. I, think, I don't know what time this is. Are we out of time? Is this where it ends? Oh, okay. All right. So, more questions? I don't have time for much of a lesson at this point. So, you guys are great. This is probably one of the best just open discussions we've ever had. So, We're, we're a uh, local church and individual supported. We're mission supported. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when we start, I said we started this by faith. We really did. Um, so our church supported us. A handful of churches that I had, pastors I'd met in this area supported us and what money we had in our pockets when we sold our house and what I had left of the logging business at that time. And, um, and I, I was told by a lot of preachers that I've never heard of this type of ministry. I'm not sure that anybody... I'm not sure it's going to work, you know. So I said, well, then I believe in it enough that what money we have in our pockets will we'll do this ministry. And uh, we, that's what we have done. Um, I'm not, I don't even know. I, I feel this is maybe getting too close to home, but, um, you know, God's faithful. We're not, we're not supported fully. We haven't been in this ministry <clears throat> but, um, you know, God's, God's, God's been faithful. So, anyway. Anybody else? If churches fail to recognize that they are in the now, then they're not inclined to start the process of replacing, you know, Right. I mean, I mean, I think that's a yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I think Paul Chapel said we're all interim pastors. There's no such thing as a full-time pastor. Every pastor is an interim because when you think about how fast life and the ministry, the window of ministry goes by, it's quick. And so I feel like every pastor is always needs to be praying for a Timothy. Lord, give me a Timothy. Give me somebody that I can invest in. Give me somebody. And if every church does their part of raising up young people to serve the Lord, there will always be enough. I've seen pastors who have focused on one young man. I've seen this a lot in the ministry. I, you know, they got this one little seedling plant that God gave them, and they, they nourish and they invest and they pour into it. He goes to Bible college. He doesn't come back to that church. And they get hurt, and they're like, look, this doesn't seem fair. Um, but here, so here's what my philosophy is. The Lord never, we don't know who's going to stay and who's going to go or what their calling is going to be at, when they're young. God's, God's got it all figured out. If we all do our part, there'll be enough to go around. You know, and rather than focusing on just that one little thing, say, hey, God, give me a bunch, give me a bushel. We want to send people out. 
We want to raise people. I know that's your pastor's heart. That's what we have to be focused on as a church, too, is that we just, Lord, give us a greenhouse full uh, to, to train up. I mean, and that's, that's a biblical model. Right. Paul says to Timothy, train up the men yep. so that you, what you've learned from me. You may be able to teach others also. Teach others and so forth and cast them the bread upon the waters. Right. You, you just need to plant the seed and just keep doing what you need to do here. Right. And, and the Lord will provide the need even. Yeah. We right. kind of get in the way a little bit, but, but we still are pretty intent on making sure that we're taken care of or that they're taken care of as, you know, as well, right? Right. Depending on who we're talking about. Right, yeah, exactly. And, and mentorship is where it's at. You know, there again, uh, Timothy and Titus were men that Paul instructed to, that the elder women teach the younger, right? Mentorship, that's what it is. That the aged men, you know, be an example to the young men, to be sober-minded, to be all these different things. And so... Even if you don't have children that are right in your life or grandchildren that are close to you, whatever the case may be, uh, pray that God gives you somebody to invest in. You know, give, Lord, give me somebody that I can, you know, some of you have so much Bible knowledge, really. And you have experience. You've seen life. You know certain things don't work. Kids are, fil- are just figuring it out on the go. And so we need church people not to say, well, that's not my problem. That's not my, that's not my area. No, no, no. Uh, uh, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That was Jesus' philosophy. He's like, hey, who, who, where? Who can I serve? What can I do? And I think that's the church. And so they like, look, I'm just going to do like the two guy, the priest and the other guy in the Good Samaritan example where they saw the mess and they went to the other side of the road. We see messes everywhere. What are we going to do? Are we going to just, you know, plug our nose and walk by, look the other way on the other side of the road? Or are we going to say, hey, God's given me an ability here. Maybe your only ability is to be compassionate and care. That's huge. You invest in people's lives by spending time listening to their problems, praying with them in person right there. There are just so many ways. And, you know, again, we weren't here for that long. This is a personal example. We were not here for overall that long, but it felt, it felt longer to me experience-wise. And Pastor Ruley taught me the two most important things I know in ministry. <laughs> You know what one of them is? Oh, well. <laughs> you ever seen that? You know what? Sometimes you have to say, oh, well. <laughs> and then the other thing, most important, he says, we're servants. We're servants. We're nothing but servants. It doesn't matter what your ministry calling is. You're really just a servant of the Lord. And so we have to be, we're all included in this. If you're a child of God, you're all part of it. You're either doing your, you're either doing what you're supposed to be, or you're not. And so, what this is the answer right here. The answer to the workers, the, all that. It's right here. Um, I'll share this. I had a guy get real angry with me. He was a. I, anybody here from the East Coast? All right, I'm going to offend one. Anybody else? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a business decision I'm going to make. No. Uh, so this guy, he, he was very to the point. Just, you know, and he's got this really small church. They need a pastor, and he's the one in charge of trying to help them. And he calls me, and he's like, and he starts going, where's all the young people at? Where's all the work? Where's all the preachers at? Where's all the missionaries at? Where's all? He just goes on. He's just going. I'm like, I don't know you, but I'm happy to let you vent. So he just went for a while. And then it felt like it was getting aggressive towards me, so I let him go for a while. And finally I said, can I ask you a question? And uh, I didn't think, that, I didn't originate this. An older evangelist taught me this, and I, I was glad I remembered it. I said, when was the last time that you sent a missionary out of your church? When was the last time you sent a kid to Bible college from your church? When was the last time, and, I, it, and he just cut me off. He's like, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But that's the answer, because a Bible college does not make a missionary or a pastor. They take what is sent to them. Now, granted, I feel like some could do better at at encouraging young people in a certain way, yes. But ultimately, they come from Christian homes or broken homes where kids get saved and the church invests in them and the pastor nourishes them and they go out. So the answer is really right here. Even if you never are called out of this church, the answer is still right here. And you're a big part of the answer. 
And so we just got to get, we got to do what we already know. We're, I, there's nothing here said today that was new, right? We just got to do it. So, okay, uh, let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for uh, what feels like time very well spent uh, as we've uh, talked about this ministry, but also talked about the big picture. And Lord, uh, we know that just talking about it ha- won't fix anything. This has been talked about for decades now. Lord, we must be people of action. Even today, I, I believe there's some action to be taken. And uh, Lord, show us what that is and help us not to have a, an emotional plea to the heart that only stops at the mind and, and then exits our being. God, help us to do what we're supposed to do. Help us to take action to be obedient. And Lord, may your name be glorified as we see another generation raised up of servants that are qualified and ready and willing uh, to follow your leading. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for.